The Wheat School on realagriculture.com is brought to you by Alberta Grains, CNM Seeds, and Syngenta Canada. Find more episodes of The Wheat School by going to wheatschool.com. Sean Haney of realagriculture.com here for another episode of The Wheat School. And today we are talking about, you know, one of the weeds that continues to create havoc for farmers really in many parts of the prairies. It is kochia. And here to talk about it today is Dr. Charles Geddes. He's a research scientist with AFC in Lethbridge, Alberta. Dr. Geddes, great to have you here today on The Wheat School. Yeah, thanks very much for the invitation. Okay, so give us an update on, I, I guess, the significance of the geography now that kochia is is really, really dampening the spirits of farmers. Yeah, for sure. So, so kochia is, I mean, traditionally, it's been an issue for farmers on the southern Canadian prairies, especially in some of the drier regions like southern Saskatchewan, and southern Alberta. Um, more recently, we've been seeing kochia becoming more of an issue uh, for farmers even starting to move further north now into, into sort of central um, Alberta, central Saskatchewan, um, and also into Manitoba as well. Um, so the, the range of kochia seems to be expanding and it's moving its way further north than it has occurred in the past. Uh, part of that is due to the biology of the plant and the other part is due to uh, herbicide resistance and, and the different types of herbicide resistance that we see in kochia on the Canadian prairies. Um, yeah. So w- when, you, when you talk about the, the the plant evolving, well, just park resistance for a second, is, is it becoming more accustomed to different climates instead of just you know thriving in the dryness of, say, a southern Alberta? Um, so, yeah, kochia, it's, it's widely adaptable to a lot of different environmental conditions. Uh, part of the the limitation of its range in the past was related to the requirement for growing degree days for seed production, um, and uh, so it's it's hard to say if the the plant is actually evolving so that that requirement is is uh, I guess looser than it was in the past, or perhaps more likely is the impact that we've been having from weather patterns on the prairies as of late, right? So. Um, warmer summers uh, resulting in greater accumulation of growing degree days further north, allowing this plant to essentially go to seed further north than it has in the past. Now, you mentioned herbicide resistance. Of course, you know, glyphosate is one of those components, but it's not limited to glyphosate. We've got resistance in some other chemistries as well. Yeah, that's right. Um, so we know that uh, in kochia, or kochia can exhibit resistance to up to five different herbicide modes of action. And uh, four of those have been identified in populations present on the Canadian prairies. Um, So we're talking about, first of all, um, groups two, uh, herbicide groups two, which which would be the ALS inhibitors, group four, which would be the oxygen mimics, group nine, which would be glyphosate, and group 14, which are the PPO inhibitors. All four of those we know to occur on the Canadian prairies. Um, and then there's also resistance to group five or photosystem two inhibitors uh, that is present in the United States. And we don't know it to occur in Western Canada, um, but that's simply because that's really not where our resistance testing efforts have focused in the past. And what is it about the kochia plant that makes it more susceptible to resistance or I'm not sure the right word to use there, but resistance comes easy to kochia. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's certainly prone to the evolution of herbicide resistance. Uh, part of that is related to the uh, wide um, genetic variability that you see in kochia uh, that helps predispose it to mutations that may confer herbicide resistance. Um, the Another part of it is related to um, the biology of the plant and how resistance spreads. Um, So it has a a type of flowering, it's called protogynous flowering, which means that the female part of the the flower becomes receptive to pollen before the male part of the flower fully develops. And that creates an initial period of forced outcrossing. And along with the outcrossing through pollen comes transfer of herbicide resistance traits. Um, so we see transfer of herbicide resistance through outcrossing, 
but we also see spread of herbicide resistance through seed as well, because it's a tumbleweed and can spread its seed across multiple fields in the same year. Yeah, if you do see those tumbleweeds flying across the road, there's a good chance that uh, it was a kochia plant not not exactly taken care of when it should have been taken care of. It, it It's also a weed that I think of in terms of coming in flushes. Like it's, it's not just like kind of one round of kochia and you, once you take care of it, you're, oh, we're good. Right. They seem to keep on coming. Is, is that a factor in this? Yeah. Well, so that, that can be part of it as well. Right. So what you're talking about is the phenology of emergence, right. And uh, kochia is, is one of the first weed species to emerge in, in fields in the spring. Right. So um, we're, we're sitting here at the beginning of April and, and we, about a month ago, uh, we saw the first kosher populations emerge, at least that we were looking for anyway, on the prairies, right? So um, it's, it definitely emerges early, but it can emerge in multiple flushes as well that are usually associated with precipitation events. Um, so you can see um, kosher flushing even after you're applying a herbicide meant to control that population. So it's, it's pretty difficult to catch the entire kosher population with a single weed control pass. I don't know if there's an official ranking out there of weed resistant weeds. Uh, you know, we, everyone always talks about Palmer amaranth is like, you know, the Mecca, the king of, you know, that that's the, that's the one you really want to make sure you never have to deal with. W- where does kosher fit? It, yeah. It, like talk about that. Yeah. So, so there's not really an official ranking out there, but there's, I mean, there's certainly problematic weeds depending on the geographical location and cropping systems that are practiced, right? So um, what what the United States is seeing with, with Palmer amaranth and water hemp um, currently on the prairies, kosher is kind of like our Palmer amaranth and water hemp right now, right? Where it is quickly becoming one of our biggest weed issues that farmers are dealing with. And one of the challenges here too is that a control strategy just based on herbicides feels like that's becoming more and more, or it maybe is now a, a losing proposition. Management is 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 changing and evolving, just like the the weed is. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, as as you start to see um, the stacking of traits that confer resistance to different herbicide modes of action. Uh, that pool of available herbicides becomes more and more limited, right? And you have less options in that toolbox. Um, and what a lot of our research is suggesting, once you start getting multiple resistance in, in kochia, um, it's it's very difficult to get ahead of the issue just through a herbicide management strategy, right? So you need to be adding in other uh, tools on top of that, other non-chemical techniques uh, targeting kochia. As you look at the the years of survey results that you have related to kosha and then you kind of you extrapolate what you're seeing and some of the trends and then you you know maybe with your you know, your your research scientist so you're you're very much in this where is this headed yeah have, yeah have for sure so so um i guess first of all one one of the the projects that uh that we uh, lead and collaborate on across the prairies is it's the the kochia surveys, right? So it's a post-harvest survey of kochia, collect uh, uh, different weed samples and test them for herbicide resistance. Um, and what we do with kochia is is we collect samples from the field, uh, bring them back to controlled environment, and screen them with different herbicides. So we focus um, in the past. There's been a lot of screening on group two uh, herbicides, but we've actually stopped screening with group two because recent results suggest that essentially all kosher populations on the prairies have some level of group two resistance. Um, Glyphosate is another main one um, where uh, our surveys between 2018 and 2021 that covered the entire prairie region, um, close to 900 samples, showed that just under three quarters of those samples have some level of glyphosate resistance. Um, And in addition, uh, just under one quarter of the samples had dicamba resistance, which is a synthetic oxen or a group four herbicide. Um, Some of our other research is focused on fluoroxpyr resistance, which is another commonly used group four herbicide. 
um, showing that fluoroxypyr resistance was in 44% of the samples in, that we tested from Alberta. We only focused on Alberta for the fluoroxypyr screening. Um, and more recently, we've identified PPO inhibitor resistance or group 14 resistance in two kosher samples from the Canadian prairies. One was sort of in West Central Saskatchewan and the other one was in Southern Alberta. Not a good result, but uh, it, it's good to have the facts that we know that this is a problem that is is one that is not in any way seem like it's going away and we're gonna have to increase our, our diligence. And for, you know, growers that have resistant kosher and they've been dealing with it, they know exactly what we're talking about here. This, this is a very, very tough weed to, to, to get a wrap around. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And, and so, so I, I mentioned that, that once you start seeing the stacking of these traits conferring resistance to multiple different herbicide modes of action, it's really hard to get ahead of the issue just by say rotating or mixing herbicides, right? Um, and so uh, what we're finding though is that, is that kosher really responds to um, what we call cultural weed management or different agronomic methods that are used to increase the ability for our crops to compete with the weed, right? So um, what we've found, uh, we've done research looking at uh, crop rotation, right? So, um, just focusing on um, alternating crop life cycles in a rotation. And what I mean by that is essentially uh, with, uh, with respect to the prairies anyway, integrating something like winter wheat into your crop rotation, right? So you have a, a winter annual in your predominantly summer annual crop rotations. Uh, what that means is that um, kosher being a summer annual, it does really well in those summer annual crops. But when you throw in a winter annual like winter wheat, the crop's already established in the spring when kosher is just emerging. So it gives the crop a competitive advantage. Um, what we're also finding is that winter wheat's typically harvested before kosher produces uh, viable seed. Uh, so you can effectively decapitate those kosher plants when you're harvesting your winter wheat and prevent seed from going back into the seed bank. Um, so we found uh, some of our research has shown that uh, just by adding in winter wheat to crop rotations and comparing those with a whole range of summer annual crop rotations, we reduced kosher biomass overall by 72% in some of our research. So that actually, that's a pretty substantial contribution just there by throwing in winter wheat into your crop rotation. Um, some of our other research is focused on row spacing and seeding rates. Uh, where we um, just threw out a crop rotation, narrowing up those row spacing, increasing this or doubling crop seeding rates throughout a crop rotation, we decreased kosher biomass by 80% overall. Um, and to put that into perspective, that's equivalent to the threshold to label, say, a new herbicide uh, for control of a particular weed, right? So um, just by optimizing plant spatial arrangement in the field by decreasing row spacing, increasing seeding rates. Uh, that goes a long way to managing that kosher issue. Well, Dr. Geddes, thanks so much for joining us here on this episode of The Weed School. Yeah, my pleasure. <laughs>